Drake Bell, mi querido Drake. Um, What do you did with that money? You see somebody, they have their own show. Well, they must be rich and buying cars. We didn't get residuals on Nickelodeon. Are you keeping touch right now? Um, I don't really keep in touch with Josh that much. The dish. enchiladas, the uh, Casa de Tony. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great, yeah. Yes. Do you like quesadillas uh, with queso? Yeah, they have to. It's a yeah, quesadilla. Que I don't understand. <laughs> it's in the name. What really happened? He started really integrating himself into my life. I was on the couch and one morning I woke up and I was, I was being assaulted. I just wanted to disappear. And so I started telling my family these horrible things. I don't want to be here anymore. She knows I'm going through really difficult situations. She just reminds me like, your son adores you. Your son loves you more than anything. So what else matters? Chicas, chiques, a todos les mando muchos saludos. Y bueno, pues hoy un episodio muy, muy especial porque tengo a alguien internacional que ha hecho muchas cosas, que marcó mucho eh, sus sitcoms, lo que yo viví, lo que mis hijos han vivido. Por supuesto, músico, cantante, eh, conductor también. Y por supuesto, actor. Lo vimos, bueno, por ejemplo, en muchas, muchos sitcoms. Por ejemplo, uno de ellos, eh, Drake and Josh, que fue una locura Drake y Josh aquí en, aquí en México. Tú has tenido varios sold outs en México. Acaba de tener un sold out de 50 mil personas. Este, viene ahora un documental muy serio con momentos eh, complicados, pero también muy del corazón y muy reales que mucha gente y muchos niños y niñas eh, han vivido, así es que me encanta que esté aquí, señores. Drake Bell, mi querido Drake. How are you doing? I'm great, I'm great. Oh, excellent. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you again. Thank you for having me. Last time I saw you was in La Máscara, because I was yes, your father in La Máscara. Yes, but I never got to see you because they're so secretive. Yes, so secretly. Yes. I, I didn't realize how I couldn't tell people I was in Mexico. I had to, we the, the outfits that we had to wear to, to go in. Crazy. I mean, with the Darth Vader yes. masks and no hablame and no sí. like I, like <laughs> no me hablas and like it was uh, yeah it was yes. it was crazy. I, I was a uh, little bones huesitos. Yeah, <laughs> I you, loved my character. I was bebe bebe alien. Bebe, and how was it about the Spanish? Investigators talk a lot in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Did you understand it was, everything? Can you speak in that well, moment? Uh, At that moment, I, my, my Spanish was, I was still honing it and getting, getting it. But, uh, but no, I mean, some of it, some of it, you know, it was, it was a little difficult, but, uh, but we made it through. Yes, you, yeah. did, you did great because I remember um, Baby Allen uh, making a lot of sounds. Yeah. yeah. And after that, when everybody knows that was you, everybody said, okay, yeah. of course. Yeah. That, that, that's why. Yep. Do you I always re re just resorted to, The things I didn't understand, I was like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, my, 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 my translator's not working. Uh, uh. Have you ever do uh, something like this? No, that was the first time I'd ever done anything like uh, a, a show like that. So it was, uh, it was definitely a new experience and uh, really exciting. Everybody in Mexico, uh, not, not just Mexico, Central America, and all the countries that yeah. saw this show, everybody Even was talking about you. I, wow. I had friends in the States that were like, Because I, you know, because you know, you can't tell anybody. No, no, anybody. You can't tell. You I can't, I, know you your can't tell your mom. Ah. I mean, it's like because who knows? Maybe she'll say something to a friend, and then she'll post it. You know, something. Exactly. They're so private about it. Um, Actually, there's an MDA. Yeah, yeah. They need to you, sign. Yeah, you can't tell anybody anything. And so uh, I even had friends from the states be, saying. What? I've been watching this this ma ma La Mascara show and I had no idea. What, why didn't you tell me? Like, I had no idea you were doing this. I'm like, I couldn't tell you. It, it was tough about uh, Spanish with all the crew, too? No, no. It's, it's, it, my, I guess my level of Spanish is, 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 is pretty, pretty okay to communicate and all that. I, I think, um, just when you're under the lights, you've got the mask on, yes. the pressure, the judges are, speaking very, very quickly. And so I'm kind of, uh, uh, like when I talk with my friends, they understand like, okay, I need to speak a little slower. Yes. And um, a lot of them are familiar with the word, like what I know, like what I know. So they'll be like, when they explain something, they'll say, wait, okay. Oh, wait, you don't know that word. Okay. Uh, oh, I can use this word. You know that. And so okay. it's kind of, they kind of, we kind of tailor it. So, yes. cause I'm still, uh, uh, estoy tomando clases, pero necesito aprender más. 
¿Cuáles son tus palabras favoritas en español? Oye, tranquilo, viejo. <risa> Drake. Drake and George, ok. Yeah. Oye, tranquilo, viejo. Yeah. Uh, do you used to speak in Spanish with somebody? With somebody that you must speak in Spanish? Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of friends here um, that don't speak any English. And so whenever we're communicating, it's, it's only Spanish. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. Have you ever think to live in Mexico? I would love to live in Mexico. I mean, I, I, especially the, the, the States right now, especially Los Angeles where I, where I lived is, it's just not the same as it used to be. And um, whenever I'm out here I, and have to go home, I'm, I, it's, I, get, I get depressed, I get sad. I'm just waiting for the next time that I can return here and, and spend more time and more time because I just absolutely, Love it here. It's starting to become, uh, I feel more at home when I'm here. I have more friends here because a lot of my friends from Los Angeles uh, have moved to Florida, Texas, Louisiana. And so my relationship with them is on the phone anyway yes. now. And so I, I, I was kind of one of the last few that actually stayed in L.A., And now when I come here, I have more friends here than I do in L.A. I wow. have more uh, things to do. And, and I find myself when I'm at home in L.A. just kind of sitting on my couch wondering when I'm going to return to Mexico. Wow. What do you love about, about Mexican food, for example? Do you have a, oh, I mean, a favorite one, the, a favorite dish? Uh, it's, that's hard. I mean... Tacos al pastor. Of course. Uh, is, I could eat that every day. Um, uh, the enchiladas, the uh, Casa de Toño. Uh, uh -huh. That's great, right, yes. If you guys want to give me a, if you guys wanna give me a sponsorship <laughs> deal, because I could eat that every day of my life. Um, it's my... Bar Misil y Casa de Toño. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exacto, exacto. Um, But no, I mean, the food out here is just unbelievable. And Have you ever tasted quesadillas? Oh, oh, sí. Oh, Do you yeah. like quesadillas uh, with queso? Yeah, they have to. It's a yeah, quesadilla. Que I don't understand. <laughs> it's in the name. Uh, we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful chat here. Cool. We're going to talk a lot, uh, a lot of things. Uh, actually... Two days ago, I guess one day ago, uh, being launched the, this um, documentary about uh, silent on the set. Oh, silent on the set. Yeah. So it's very very tough and talk about uh, a lot of different um, hard things that, I, I, of course, I want to ask you about all this because you are one of the main characters of this documentary. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about your new single cool. that talks about. All your, not all your life, so the toughest moments mm -hmm. of your life, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah this, uh, I was approached about this documentary last year, um, right before, actually, I had uh, gone into rehab. And I was just in a place in my life, I, I, I was kind of spiraling and my, me my mental state was I, I was, I was in a bad place. And... Um, I was approached by this documentary and I immediately turned it down and said, I'm not ready to talk about these things, these parts of my life. And I, um, shortly after that, I went into rehab and it was a really interesting experience because you think of rehab as, okay, well, I'm going to go someplace where I can't, you know, put any toxic things in my body and I'll, I'll get clean and I'll be sober um, and then I'll come home and I'll be better. I, I didn't realize that, you know, there's so much trauma therapy and one-on-one um, -on -one counseling and group therapy and family, and therapy. family therapy and all of these things that you're dealing with and for the, you know, um, but doing it, facing it head on completely clear and sober minded. And so you're not able to, you really have to face these, these dark um, issues that you've been dealing with your whole life, but not, not knowing how to. Mm -hmm. And 
so I went through a lot of self-reflection and unearthing and digging up things that I've just held inside my whole life. And then feeling comfortable enough around people who, for the first time, were living similar situations, had similar um, experiences. And it was, I finally felt comfortable to, you know, you hear a story from someone else in group therapy and you're like, oh, okay. I, well, I can talk about what happened to me because I, because you always feel so alone and, and that no one's going to understand you. And it's, everyone always said, oh, you know, reach out for help and ask for help. But it, when you're dealing with it all on your own, you don't, you, you feel like people aren't going to understand or they're not going to get you. And they, they, they haven't had such uh, experiences like this or situations in their life like me. And they, they won't understand me or they'll judge me. Um, but there I felt for the first time that, wow, these people, I'm around people that just want to see me get better and, and be healthy and, and start figuring out what it is that's driving me to do things that are so out of character for me or, or you know, trying to escape in yeah. unhealthy ways. And um, so it was really great. And then after I spent a, a lot of time in there, uh, when I came out, I was approached by the documentary again and was able to see it kind of through a different lens. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt, you know, I've been sharing so much in rehab and, and really talking about these things. And maybe it, maybe it is time to sit down and, and talk about and it. tell my story. I guess this, this stuff is really going to help to a lot of people, not just kids, parents mm -hmm. too, to be aware about all these things that can happen. Um, congratulations, really, because I, I know, I, I, and I guess everybody know, it isn't easy to do something like this. Yeah. So we're going to talk about this uh, uh, in the interview. And um, Actually, two days ago was a trending topic about uh, worldwide about um, quiet on set. So we yeah. want to talk about, but I want to start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, you were born in California, right? Yes, I was. Okay. How was your, your childhood? I had a very interesting childhood. I, I was born in uh, Fountain Valley, California. And my, uh, my mom was a professional billiards player. Wow, this is... She's a two-time world champion. Wow. Uh, she's in the Hall of Fame. She's uh, one of the greatest players of all time. And so... Yeah. You, did you go with her to the tournaments? I, I, I did. When I was really little, I... I I, uh, not, not all the time, but okay. there were, there were a few, um, I remember one, especially I, uh, it was in Atlanta, Georgia and it was my first tournament that I'd gone to with her. I think it was for my seventh birthday. <clears throat> and in my mind, my mom always won. Okay. I mean, my mom wins. She's the greatest. She's the greatest. She never loses. And she was down to the finals, it was, uh, it was between her and a, a player named Gerda Hofstetter, and it, they were the last two, and Gerda won, and my little seven-year-old heart Whoa. was just broken. I just burst into tears. I was just so Whoa. sad. I was crying. My mom came to me. She hugged me, and immediately at seven years old, I saw her opponent as the enemy. Of course. I was, I was like, why did you do that to my mom? Like you're, you know, because it's, I, my mom. it's my mom and, <laughs> and you're, you're the enemy and I can't like you. And so that was a, a great learning moment for me at such a young age where, you know, my mom's a sportsman. And so she had to sit me down and say like, no, 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 honey, honey, we're all friends. Like all, all these girls on the tour, like we, hang out afterwards and go to dinner and watch movies in our hotel room and make popcorn and, and we're all friends. Like this is just 
friendly competition. So sometimes, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose, but if somebody beats me, they just play better that day and there's another tournament coming and we all go out and congratulate each other and have dinner and, and, and a lot of these uh, players ended up becoming like, like they were my Thea's and Theo's and, and because we were, they, they're, they're so close on the tour um, that it, it gave me like, uh, especially because of going into acting mm -hmm. and being in such a competitive sure. world myself, it, it was a great lesson to learn like, hey, when you go in and you see a room full of people going for the same role as you or going for this, you know, you can make it a friendly competition. Just because somebody booked the role, you don't have to be like, ah, I don't want to be around. You know, we, so I had a lot of friends growing up in the business and we would, you know, go out for the same roles a lot. And of um, I think that that was a nice, a nice lesson for me yes. to learn, hey, you know, this is a sport and at the end of the day, it's friendly competition and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah. It doesn't have to. It was a great lesson, especially yeah. in that on that age. Yeah, you know, because we were talking about ages and all the things that a kid can learn, like your yeah. son. Yep. So it was seven years that yeah. lesson. Yeah. Is it okay? And are you a good uh, pool player? Uh, I can beat my friends. I, <laughs> pool is a it's a difficult sport because it's not like riding a bike. I mean, you really have to devote your time to it, and when you go away from it for a while and come back. It's you gotta you gotta get back in stroke and you're you're rusty, but but when I'm when I'm playing on a consistent basis, I'm I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. Um, but so my mom was a professional billiard player. My dad um, had just uh, lost a, a, a successful furniture business that he had uh, been working on um, that he owned, and I was the baby of the family. And then at at, at about four about four years old, my 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 mom and my dad started having issues in the marriage and um, decided to separate. And um, because my mom was touring so much, I spent a lot of time with my dad. And my dad was um, really big into, was really a fan of baseball and played baseball when he was younger and in college. And my grandpa, it, my, my dad's side of the family was a baseball family. My, my, um, my cousin actually ended up going on to be an all-star uh, baseball player for okay. um, the major leagues and became a world-renowned uh, pitcher for, uh, I think he ended up on the, the Padres. But so, so my dad got me into Little League and was trying to find things to do with me that we could do together and you know go out and throw the ball and all this. But I just, I didn't take to... I loved baseball, but I didn't take to it. I, I was having more fun in the dugout, making people laugh and okay. and telling stories and 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 being more animated. And my dad raised me on classic TV. Uh, I don't think I saw a color TV show until I was like, wow. you know, was eight years old. Because we you would have a color TV. Well, yeah. well we, but but he, we were always watching the Munsters and and, yeah. and all of these old shows. And he introduced me to um, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Abbott and Costello, the Marx Brothers, Charlie Chaplin, the the classics of comedy. And wow. when I saw, um, I was really into Abbott and Costello. But when I saw Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis something clicked in me and I, I i mean i it's so funny because i was so young when i saw this but About. but still something in my brain went that's what i want to do do you I, remember exactly the moment it was a movie called uh, the caddy and it was because i loved making people laugh okay i wanted to be on stage i wanted to act i didn't know we grew up in orange county we weren't in hollywood we weren't in la none of my family was in, in the business, so I didn't know if that was ever a possibility, um, but I knew I wanted to be funny and make people laugh. But I also had this obsession with music. My dad was always playing Elvis and the Beatles and Buddy Holly and um, 
the Rolling Stones and Queen and all of these bands in the house and, and the Beach Boys. And I think one of the first things I did uh, when I, I was like two or three years old and I would get up on the coffee table and he would play the Beach Boys and I would sing, wow. you know, Surfing USA and Surfing <laughs> Safari. And um, so I had this passion for music. I hadn't started playing music yet, but I had this passion for music. So when I saw Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, I went, wait a second, Dean Martin is this singer and he's belting out these beautiful songs, but then there's this clown next to him that's being wild and crazy and making people laugh. I was like, man, if I could combine those two guys, that would be, that would be my dream. Wow. And so my dad ended up, uh, he was in a, a, a session for counseling for the marriage and he um, picked up a magazine and at the back of the magazine, there was an advertisement basically saying, you know, Hollywood connection. Does your kid want to act? You know, your kid want to be in movies or something like that. How old were you at that moment? I was about five. Okay. And my dad kept the magazine and he's like, wait a second, maybe that might be something that Drake would be interested in doing. And so he came home one day and he said, hey, would you like to be in, uh, would you want to be on TV? Would you want to be making movies and, and all this? And I thought, are you kidding me? Like, this would be amazing. Get to go on, get to, get to, be, to do what I love. Like, I didn't even know that was possible. And so okay. he got us a meeting with a, a, a manager and she was asking me, you know, would you want to be in the commercial showing off these awesome toys and eating these sugary cereals and, and all of this. Popsicles. And I, yeah, and popsicles. Yeah. That was actually interesting you say that. That was my first commercial I got. Wow. Was for a, a washer and dryer company. Okay. And I had to sit down on a tree stump and eat popsicles. And the popsicle had to drip onto my shirt. And then my mom washes it and it takes the stain out. Well, we have to do take one, take two, different <laughs> angles. And so I'm five years old well, and so I'm eating these popsicles. popsicles and they're like, all right, we got to do another one. Here's your popsicle. I'm like, okay, okay, we got to do another one. one. Here's your popsicle. I go, wait a minute, free popsicles? <laughs> I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Dad, yes. let's keep doing, let's do I mean, this. Five like, years old. Yeah, and, and just getting popsicles no. handed to me. And I was like, I'm in heaven. I'm like, yes. this, is, this is the business for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So your father uh, gives you a lot of tools. And do they have a rough moment after divorce? They, they, weren't, um, they weren't the best of friends. Okay. <laughs> so it, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. And, and nothing against my parents, because I know that you know, they were dealing with their own things. But it was, it was difficult because, because they weren't getting along. I would be at my mom's house and my mom would be saying something about my dad and, you know, your dad's this, your dad's that. My, my dad would say your mom's this. And I've, I've discussed this with them mm -hmm. recently of, and, and, and which I've brought into my relationship with my son and our situation is hopefully, and, and maybe it was a blessing that I, that I experienced that so that I don't repeat it. Um, but it made me feel, and I don't think I knew it at the time, but Looking back, it made me feel like, wait a minute, but I'm half of him and I'm half of her. And if you say he's this and you say yes. she's this. Exactly. Well, then. You're talking about me. What am I? You're yeah. talking a little bit about me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's something I've realized later in life um, and have been able to work through and, and figure out that, you know, maybe a lot of what I felt about myself stemmed from what was being said around me, not necessarily who I truly and really was. Um, but so it was, it was, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the best, but um, luckily I had this, this great creative outlet. Um, you know, I loved acting as soon as the lights went on and I, I was able to enter a different world and escape and, and, and just play different characters. And I was, um, that, was that was sort of my escape of throughout my life.
quite lo hacemos delicioso. Había un muñeco por ahí sin cabeza. Yo vivo solo. O sea, conclusión, tengo muchos libros. Bueno, es interesante estar dentro de un, de un castillo. Aquí se cerraban los tratos de los diputados. No te luzcas en frente de las cámaras. ¡Ay, ya pico, ya pico! Estamos en Maastricht. Estoy en Buenos Aires y yo estoy ahorita aquí en Whistler, Canadá. A ver, Elías, explica tú. Como el de WhatsApp, muy bien. Y todavía pasando el segundo espejo, este ya cosí. Tienes dos, dos canijas. Primero se pelean y luego se, mueven, se huelen la cola. Igualito que nosotros. Hay que tener mucho cuidado porque ya les dije que en esta cocina, exactamente en ese lugar donde está Mona, sí. fue donde desayunó D'Artagnan antes de que pues, se lo echaran. ¡No seas mamón, cabrón! Visita nuestro canal de vlogs y suscríbete ahora. Está muy divertido. Bueno, ya estamos de regreso con mi querido Drake Bell, Drake Campana, como algún día dijeron que se había cambiado, pero nunca se cambió. Fue una broma. It was, you were just kidding yeah. when you say about Campana yeah. because there was notes in on oh, the newspaper. Every, especially What happened especially that moment? in the U.S. I mean, everyone was saying, oh, he changed his name and moved to Mexico and all of this. I was just on the airplane and I was joking around. I was like, how do you say bell in Spanish? Oh, campana? Oh, okay. Soy tres campana. And like, it was just a joke. And <laughs> yes. then everyone took it as like, I legally changed my name. Like, it, was, it was just unbelievable. It, but that's, that's, you know, it's interesting because when I was working in, in Hollywood, there was, there was a, a big amount of, of time But there was no social media. There was no YouTube, Twitter, all of this, Instagram. And it's interesting to have both sides where you make a joke and all of a sudden just the rumor mill and all the rumors start happening and circulating around you and you're going, wow, I got to be careful. <laughs> yes. Yes, because there's a lot of gossip and yeah. news that they live about that and yep. they're just searching about all this stuff. Yeah. It, yes. Well, well, okay. After that popsicle uh, TV commercial, yeah. uh, where did you start about sitcoms, about acting? I started working more, a lot of commercials, um, everything. And earning money. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did you did with that money? Well, it's interesting because the, the perception of You know, you see somebody on TV, they did a commercial. Oh, they must live in a mansion in L.A. now. But, and this was uh, a, a big issue, especially when I started working on Nickelodeon and Drake and Josh. And, you know, you see somebody, they have their own show. Well, they must be rich and buying cars and living in mansions. And But the reality of it is, Taxes are very high, so we're spending almost 40%, 40%, 50% of our money on taxes. Um, then I have 15% going to a manager, 10% going to an agent. And then if we're at the point where we're on a show or something, we're hiring publicists, we, we have to buy, we have to pay for headshots, we have to get, you know, gas to get to audition. I mean, The, the, there's so many expenses. There's so many expenses that at the end of the day, you're not really, there's not some big pot of gold that's being stashed away. Um, it's very, very small amounts. And unfortunately, eventually, when I started working on Nickelodeon, we didn't get residuals on Nickelodeon. Okay. So we're on network TV. Shows like Malcolm in the Middle or Two and a Half Men or Home Improvement, all these, you know, friends, they get residuals every single time the show's played or the show's sold. Um, all around the world, they're getting paid. But for us, we got paid the week of work. Yes. And which was not. Just one I mean, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was it was a. It was a big sum for, you know, being. For kids, for, for teenagers. Being, being 15. And it was a large sum. But again. Taxes, agency fees, management fees, rent, living in an apartment, all of this. And um, so, and we didn't work 52 weeks out of the year. We only did 13 episodes, 26 episodes. So um, there were times we only did six episodes. So there wasn't, uh, 
a steady stream of income. Yes. You had to stretch this out and make it last for yes. the whole year. Of course. Um, so it's interesting when, when I, cause I get asked that question a lot, like, well, what'd you do with the money, you know? And they're just, in our case, there just wasn't this huge amount of money. You know, I, I did start working later. I was able to buy a house, but when you're so young, you don't understand the responsibility that goes into that. You don't understand that you have to keep up with a mortgage and you have to do this. And there's as, just as so as much. At what age did you buy your I bought house? my house when I was 19 or 20. Wow. And so. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lost I, it all by 30. <laughs> I want to work at Nickelodeon or not. No, you don't. You definitely don't. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. <laughs> um, but so I... Um, yeah, and, 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 and especially not having the tools on how to manage your money or having people around you that you trust and you realize that you should yes. have trusted. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of ups and downs financially. I went bankrupt um, okay. at a very young age, and that was traumatic in itself. A um, lot of life lessons, a <laughs> lot, of, lot, of, lot of things to learn along the way. Did you have a moment that you get crazy about the, mo the money? Oh my, I'm 20 minutes ago. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there was definitely, it's, it's, it's a never ending struggle of trying to make ends meet and keep it in, 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 because also you're working in a job that doesn't have any, you know, a normal job you go and you're like, okay, I'll start in this position. Hopefully I'll work my way up the ladder, maybe get promoted. I'll, I have a steady income. Yes. I can budget accordingly, but with entertainment, <clears throat> you don't know when your next job's coming. You don't know if you're gonna book the next, when, I mean, you could book a, a movie and then not work for three years. Yes. So yes. It's, it's really hard. It's very, very hard to figure out how to um, budget and make this money last. And especially when you get it at a young age, you imagine that it's just always going to be there. Like, this is my life now and more will come and more projects will come. And so I can spend copious amounts of money on things to have fun. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want that car. Okay. And but you don't realize like, hold on, you need yes. to, you really need to focus on every penny that comes in and where it's going and who's it being paid to and what's left, what's left over for you. Because, the other thing, you, you book a show and you're like, oh, this is my pay for the week. Okay, I'm gonna go buy this. I'm buy, and then you're like, wait a minute. That's not what you're getting. That's just your gross income. Like you have, to, you have to figure out what's left over for you and then budget according to that. Yes. And so <clears throat> getting that at such a young age, it's hard to, you know, you didn't, I didn't go to school for business. I didn't have a, you know, so it's, it, there's a lot of um, traps that you can find yourself yes, in. Yes, of course. I, I guess this, all, all that stuff happened to a lot of kids that start really, really, yeah. really early in this media. Yeah. You know? So when was your first sitcom or your first? Um, um, I was doing like guest spots on shows like Home Improvement, Drew Carey Show. I was doing a lot of guest spots. And then I um, got an audition for a show called The Amanda Show, and I grew up watching Nickelodeon. And that, in my at the time, uh, with your father. Yeah, yeah. Well, so how, how do you get there? Well, well, well <laughs> so I first you watch it on TV, on TV, and after you were there, and then, and then it was like a dream. I mean, wow. I was on set. I was like, wow, Nickelodeon. I mean, this is all I've wanted to do. Like, this is what I wanted to, where I wanted to be. And um, you make an, uh, an audition? audition? Yes. Yeah. So I did an audition and I had to come up with, it was a comedy show like Saturday Night Live where okay. you had to play a bunch of different characters. And I, they asked me to come in with three original characters okay. and had to write the material myself. Um, but I had already been doing so many voices and I loved that. that I, this was a dream and I loved sketch comedy. And so I came in with like, 28 different characters and just in did that them vision? Yeah, and just went wow. boom, 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 boom with all these different characters and got the call back, eventually um, booked the show. Of course. And it was really cool because I, Amanda 
had been on, sh on a show called All That prior to the Amanda show. And she, she was a star to me. Yes. You know, I mean, I grew up watching her and getting the opportunity to now play alongside her was, I mean, I was just in heaven and it was a, it was a really great time. And uh, we were filming on the, the Paramount studio lot, which has so much Hollywood history. And I am fascinated by the history wow. of Hollywood. And so I would walk around the set. They had, you're walking down one area and then you make a right and all of a sudden you're in New York. You know, they're, all the buildings and all the houses and everything. And you're just wow. like, this is amazing. And I, we had bicycles and we'd ride around all of the set and movie star. I mean, it looked like a movie when you see the back lot. You yes, know, all the back lot. Movie lots. stars and cameras and lights and a movie shooting over here and a show shooting over here and all the trailers. And, and uh, it was... It was heaven and me and my dad had a really close relationship at that time and we just couldn't believe that I, uh, and that was the dream was to not have to audition every day and go work on a show for one week and then go back to auditioning. I was finally a regular on a show and uh, working every week okay. and, um, and so it was a really, really great time. But that was the first show that uh, I was a regular on. And how was the ambience in that moment at Nick? with all the kids before Drake and Josh? Um, the Amanda show was great. Uh, the first season was really awesome. Uh, and I think, you know, getting into what the documentary talks about, it wasn't until the second season um, that things started to, uh, it started to get, um, Get, get to just get really bad. I didn't watch the documentary uh, till now, but I know all the things that talk about it, mm -hmm. and it's very hard. Um, first, uh, how Drake and Josh start? Drake and Josh started from, so the second season of Amanda show, mm -hmm. Josh Peck became a, a, a cast member. He wasn't on the first season. So he came in second season. To meet her for first time. First time on that moment. On that moment, yeah. Okay. And we weren't doing many sketches together. Uh, me and Amanda were still sort of the key players. But there was a sketch called Tony Pajamas where we played uh, kind of like a little Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, like mafia guys. Like, hey, how you doing? You know? And um, the, we were put together in a sketch. And I, it, it was really an amazing moment because Amanda was not the, the lead character of this sketch. It was the first time we'd worked together, me and Josh, like closely. And we were doing this, this, this scene and he was making me laugh so hard. I couldn't even... We had to do so many takes because every time he would do something and we were going back and forth and improvising and things were coming out that was, you know, and the audience was laughing and the crew was cracking up. And finally, when we, I pulled it all together and was able to get through the scene, something clicked in me where I looked at him and I went, there it is. The Martin and Lewis, the Abbott and Costello, all the buddy comedies that I grew up on that I wanted to do there he is, like, and, you know, something shined down on us and put us together as this, yeah, this, com this, comedy, this comedy duo. Little did I know that we would go on to, you know, our names would be inseparable from each other f in the future. Um, but so the, 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 the producers and writers started seeing our chemistry and putting us together more. And there was one scene where all it said in the script were, was Drake and Josh fight over a shrimp. And it was just this, we're, walk, it's, we're playing ourselves as we would often do in the show, had sort of a behind the scenes uh, aspect to it sometimes and we would play ourselves. And we're just walking down the street and a shrimp falls from the sky, just like a little grilled shrimp. And Josh says, hey look, and there's no dialogue. It just says we okay. fight over a shrimp. So they're like, all right. So be like, creative. Go do something. Wow. And so Josh stops and he's like, hey, look, a shrimp. 
Oh, no, no. I said, I say, hey, look, a shrimp. And Josh says, oh, I want, I want it. And then I go, hey, no, no, no. I want the shrimp. No, I want the shrimp. And then we get into this full on wrestling match over the shrimp. And we're saying things like, you know, Josh is like, I love shellfish. And I'm like, don't step away from the shrimp, Josh. Nothing to see here. <laughs> and, and we're just coming up with these things. And at that time, the network was looking for a buddy comedy. Um, and as the producers were watching this sketch, one of the writers leaned over to the executive producer and said, hey, hey. Where's this? There's your buddies right there. And so a little bit after that, we were approached and asked if we would want to go and um, be on our own show and, and do a, a more sitcom style show uh, together uh, to which, I mean, I can't speak for Josh, but I, I was, yes. I mean, I couldn't, I, I was like, just enough, enough. Like, yes, the answer is yes, you know. And, um, and then we, we were able to spin off. It took a little, it took a while and took time to convince the network because they wanted to pick up a few other shows. They really okay. didn't want to pick up Drake and Josh. Um, but eventually, uh, the network was convinced that, uh, this was a show that they would move forward with. Okay. And we ended up doing okay. Drake and Josh. Um, the first uh, season was a successful season. Um, once we aired, yeah, once we aired, we were, we were received really well, but it took a long time to convince the network. We shot a pilot and it took almost a year to get picked up and go to series, which is a long time. Um, and so we weren't sure if the show was going to get picked up. We had fun shooting the pilot, how, you know, how that always goes. And, uh, but eventually we got the call that we got picked up, but they only picked us up. A normal season on Nickelodeon would be picked up for 13 episodes, okay. but they were so unsure about the show that they only picked us up for six episodes. Okay. And so the first season is only six episodes. Um, but luckily the fans loved it and we continued on for four more years. How many seasons did you do? We did four seasons okay, and two four. movies. And two movies. Yeah. Well, um, did you become a real friend? Three movies. Three movies. Okay. Did you become real friends behind scenes? Josh and I's relationship was like, I, I, I would compare it to real brothers. I mean, there were some times when we were inseparable, sometimes when we had great times together, and then sometimes when I, you know, we didn't want to be around each other, of you course. know. So, um, and we were going through our adolescence at that time, and I was dealing with a lot of a lot of dark things and what I've read and, you know, and I've talked to Josh later in life and what he's come out with in his book and, and in interviews. Um, I realized that we were both going through a lot of personal traumatic um, situations and experiences that we were dealing with that probably contributed to the moments that we were mm -hmm. at odds with each other. Are you keeping in touch right now? Um, I don't really keep in touch with Josh that much. There's a lot of people on the show that I do keep in touch with. I'm great friends with um, uh, Jonathan Goldstein, who played my dad on the show, uh, Nancy Sullivan, who was my mom, uh, Yvette Nicole Brown, who played Helen, um, and a lot of the, the crew members are, are, are still, uh, uh, we text and talk a lot. And so I made a lot of great relationships on that show. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't talk to Josh that much. Okay. Um, how was a normal recording day uh, at the set? It was fun. Do you have fun with the other kids? How was it? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I, I was doing what I loved, so it was great, but it was grueling, you know, getting, getting to work at, you know, early in the morning, we would rehearse for three days. Um, then we would shoot for two days and the, 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 sh the shooting days would be very, very long hours. And, um, but, um, for me, I was dealing with a lot of stuff inside okay. because of things that had happened on the Amanda show. Um, during that break between the pilot of Drake and Josh and actually going to series, um, was when, 
everything sort of came to a head with my with what was happening to me and the abuse that I had endured and um, all of that. So it, um, there was a lot of inner turmoil and, and things that I didn't know how to handle. Uh, but like I said, when the lights went on and it was showtime, that was my, that was my heaven. That was my time to escape. And that was, I just absolutely loved it. And um, what really happened inside everything? Because I know there was all this Brian Peck uh, information mm -hmm. on this documentary. Um, if you feel comfortable, could you share about what happened? Yeah, so it was the second season of Drake and Josh. I mean, excuse me, of The Amanda Show. Uh -huh. Second season so of The Amanda. before Drake and Josh. Before Drake and Josh. Second season, season of The Amanda Show. And um, there, there, usually there's what's on set what's called a dialogue coach. And there's somebody that's on set that you can run lines with, that's there to... Uh, they're just there to kind of help you memorize your dialogue and... Uh, You know, if if you have something to do, they can act as a stand-in for you. Um, and he um, he came onto the show. No relation to Josh Peck. I know that gets a little confusing. Um, but uh, but yeah, you're talking I, about Brian. Yeah, and and Brian came onto the show, and at first, you know, he was. Um, He, he was very, very connected in Hollywood. He'd been working for many years and he had uh, great relationships uh, or relationships with famous producers and directors and actors. And um, he just had funny stories. He knew so much about the history of Hollywood and there were things, you know, we, he got along with everybody really well. Um, but then... Uh, he started really integrating himself into my life. He created a, a, a wedge between my dad and I, telling me that my dad was stealing my money and parents shouldn't be their kids' managers and he doesn't want him to be... The, the studio doesn't want my dad to be on the set because he's too involved and because a lot of the parents would just be in the green room or in another room while the kids were on set working. And, um, but my dad was always, you know, if like he would be sitting in that chair right now, of course. you know, he's always near you, near you watch near me watching what's going on. And Brian was expressing, Oh, that's not a plate. That's not where the parents are supposed to be. And they're get he gets in the way. And, and it, as a kid, you know, you're, you're trusting that this person knows what he's talking about because he's been in the business for so long. So many people respect and trust him. How old were you? Uh, 14, 13, 13, okay. 13, wow. 14. Um, and so he became my dialogue coach. He became my acting coach. I would often go to his house and have, Uh, if I had an audition, we would work on dialogue. Spending the night? Not yet. My dad was always there. My dad was always, if I was working on dialogue, my dad would be sitting on the couch, always okay. within eye distance, always and always. Just watching. Yeah, yeah, just watching. And and he started to get, he started to feel uncomfortable with just the way that Brian would interact with me. And he would tell He would tell um, the network, or the, the people at the network, hey, you know, I haven't seen anything that's crossed the line, but I just don't feel comfortable with the way that I'm seeing Brian interact with my son. He's very touchy. He's always got his arms around him. He's always finding an excuse to take him somewhere else. Oh, I gotta, let's go work on this dialogue. We'll go in this other room over here and all this. So he just wasn't feeling comfortable. And the network's response was, oh, well, you don't understand, you know, um, Brian's gay and he's just a very touchy feely person. And um, that's just his personality. And there's nothing you need to worry about. You're, you know, you're, 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 you're being homophobic and, you know, oh. it's not, you know, 
this is Hollywood and we have many different people that, you know, we're a melting pot and you have to have respect for everybody and not judge people. And, um, and so my dad was just like, okay. And then he would see something and tell the network again. And then he would get the same response. Whoa. And so Brian, I think started getting cut, catching wind of that. My dad was raising red flags to the network. So my, so he really impressed on me your dad's a problem. Your dad's causing issues. Um, he's stealing your money. You know, you, you did this and you did that. You should have all this money in the bank and all this not, you know, knowing that at 13, 14 years old, I don't understand taxes and agent yes. percentages and management fees and this, all this, all of these things that go into it. Um, so he convinced me that, oh, Okay, the, my dad, and there's so many horror stories in Hollywood of parents stealing their kids' money and yes. their kids turn, kids turning 18 and having no money and working for all of their lives. So I didn't want that to happen. Um, yes, he was manipulating completely. Uh, 13 years old yeah. kid. Yeah, totally, totally convinced me that my dad needs to be out of the picture and he needs to be managing me and introducing me to the right agents and producers and directors and getting me the roles, you know, and kind of guiding my career because this is what you want to do and I can help facilitate you to get to where you want to go. Um, and so eventually I parted ways with my dad um, and Brian basically stepped in and everything was normal and well, I mean, in hindsight, mm -hmm. wasn't that normal. Um, but to me at that time, I didn't feel like I was in any danger. I was just doing what I do. And we were going to auditions and my mom lived in Orange County, which is an hour away from LA. So Brian was like, no, I can take him to the audition. Like you don't have to drive all the way up to LA. And then it started to get to where, oh, well, he's got three auditions today. We're going to be done late. Why doesn't he just stay at my house? I'll take, I'll bring him home in the morning. And those, it, I was feeling comfortable because I would stay at Brian's house and it, nothing would happen. I mean, we'd, I'd, we'd get home, I'd watch some TV, I'd crash on the couch and- Where did you slept in that I, moment? On the couch in the living room and um, he would be in his room and everything was like totally normal. Um, uh, but, but there were major warning signs that I didn't, realize and my I, I guess my mom didn't realize that like for example I was dating a girl at the time um, and now at this point I'm probably uh, 14 and a half and I was dating a girl and she um, my Brian was telling my mom because my mom was very Christian and values and didn't want me you know having sex before marriage or, you know, doing any of this stuff with my girlfriend. So he latched onto that and was like, oh, you need to keep Drake away from his girlfriend because they're just trying to sneak off into the woods. And, and, and if you want Drake to not be doing those things, he needs to spend more time with me and he shouldn't be around his girlfriend. And so he started doing things like that to where he could get more time and more time with me. Um, and then One morning, uh, I woke up and I was on the couch and one morning I woke up and I was, I was, I was being sexually assaulted. And at that moment, everything changed. And I was like, wow, my life's never going to be the same. And I don't know how I, I'm so entrapped in this situation because he's so connected. He's so, um, everybody loves this guy and, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what to do now. And from there I was basically trapped and it became uh, about a year of um, just perpetual and abuse and it got, it, it got worse and worse and worse and worse Whoa. and worse. And did you tell him something 
Yeah, I mean, it would, it, 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 with, with this situation, you know, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, it'll never happen again. I, 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 it was a lapse in judgment and uh, I'm so sorry, it'll never happen again. Um, and then it just, it just continued. And, and I, I couldn't tell my mom, oh, no, I don't want to go over to Brian's house it's because then we'll, why, so why, why, what's going on, what's happening? And I was so afraid of just everything, you know, what are people going to think of me? What are people going to say? What are, am I going to be able to do what I love to do? Am I going to lose yes. everything that I've worked on? Am I going to, is he going to, am I going to be demonized in this Hollywood world? And am, are people going to believe me? Uh, just everything that you deal with. And at such a young age, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. Um, and so that went on for quite a long time. And, and I was just totally, uh, lost. I, I, that's when I think everything started to spiral out of control for me. I, I, uh, you know, I started uh, at first before the abuse started, there were things that were happening at his house that shouldn't have happened. Like. I was able to drink because there were, he would have parties and I could drink my, you know, I could, I could drink at his house and I could get drunk and I'm spending the night here anyway. And my mom's never going to know. And, and so, but nothing's happening. I, I feel safe. I just feel like I'm at my friend's house that I could do stuff at that I want to do that. Yeah, every he's preparing kid me for life. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but it started to become where I think he was using, you know, alcohol and being, being intoxicated to really like, for lack of better words, you know, loosen me up into, uh, being out of my, out of my mind and, and being able to take advantage of those situations. And, um, Did he use some of the drug more than alcohol. Uh, there were, I mean, I can't confirm nor deny what went on, but there was a lot of, it got really dark. It got oh. really, really dark. And um, so I was living through that um, with no escape or anything. And we had gotten the, the call <clears throat> that Drake and Josh was getting picked up. And he, there was a role, they were gonna recast the dad on the show. And so there was an open role for a, for a guy about his age. And he was like, Oh, you know, you got to convince the network. Like that would be a great role for me. Like I no would, way. yeah, like I could play the dad on the show and that's a great role. And you got like, you need to convince the network that I could, I could be. And I, and in my mind, I'm like, bro, you're not coming anywhere near like that's my show now. Now I'm now I, can say what happens like there it's Drake and Josh. Like that's my shit. Like I can tell the network, you're not coming anywhere near that show, but how do I tell the network? Hey, I don't want this person to be a because. part of the show because blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I don't know why or how I don't remember the exact conversation. I mean, I remember the exact conversation. I don't know the catalyst or why I just finally, um, exploded. And there were moments, prior where out of nowhere, my mom would say, Oh, Brian's coming to pick you up. I'm like, I don't have an audition. I don't want to go there. What, 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 why is he coming here? And she's like, what's going what's on that? And my girlfriend at the time, just so many red flags were going up. Um, he would just show up to my girlfriend's house. He would be, he would, you know, I would say, oh, I don't want to go hang out. But then he would just show up at the house because we were doing a lot of extracurricular activities. We'd go to Disneyland with him and his friends and we were doing all these other things and going to dinners and all of this parties and everything. And my girlfriend was going, you know, why is this person so attached to you outside of work and what is going on? And her mom did not like it at all. And there was one time when, um, I was uh, supposed to go to Disneyland with him and uh, I just 
I had started spending a lot of time at my girlfriend's house. Um, and I just felt safe there. Like I just, that was of course. somewhere I felt safe. Her mom was very, very protective over me. Um, we had a really, really great relationship and my girlfriend and I were just best friends. I mean, oh, I'm gonna start crying. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Um, uh, but we were best friends, like just inseparable, um, she and I. And so I felt really, really comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. Um, so I started feeling. Thank you about confidence. Yeah. Thank you about all this. I, I know that it's really, really tough to talk about this. Thank you. I yeah, really it's, appreciate it. It's, because I know that there's so many people watching outside. Uh, parents yeah. and kids and everybody saying this still happened. Yeah. Uh, um, kids are afraid about that, but yeah. sorry about the interruption. But no, and, and, and so, uh, you know, we're, we were just, we loved the same music. We loved the same movie. We, we just were so connected. And I think it, it, at that age, that's your whole world, yes. you know? And so I, And do you, do you think she felt what was going on? A hundred percent. She, I mean, we knew each other. We were so close and connected, she and I, that, that um, she a hundred percent knew. And I was so close with her mom too, that they knew something was going on. Something was, something was up. And also seeing changes in my behavior and my, my mood swings and, anger issues and all of this. And there was just something going on. Well, there was one night when um, I was supposed to go to Disneyland and I didn't want to go. I just wanted to stay at my girlfriend's house. I wanted to be with her. I wanted to watch movies. I wanted to- To keep safe. I just wanted to be, uh, yeah. And, and, and also I just, I wanted to be with her, you know? And wow, it's really hard to talk about her. Mm -hmm. um, So we, um, he started calling my phone saying, Hey, I'm going to come pick you up at, at, at your girlfriend's house. And, um, we're going to go to Disneyland. And I just ignored, ignore, 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 ignore. And he started calling. I mean, I actually talked recently with, uh, with her. And, and he never invited her? No. No, no. The very few times I talked to her recently and she reminded me of very few times that we did something all together, like going to a, a dinner party at a friend's house or um, I can't remember what the other situations were, but she mentioned to me, she's like, do you remember that time when we went with him to this place mm -hmm. and this happened and we went to the, and, <clears throat> and I was like, wow, I, There's a lot that I've, black, that I've blocked out that I don't remember. And she was bringing up all of these times. And she goes, do you remember that time he called my house a hundred times? And I ripped, and actually I forgot about this, um, but she had gotten so angry that uh, she went and she ripped the phone. At, oh, I didn't get there yet. So she's calling, he's calling my phone. I'm ignoring it. Well, he had my girlfriend's home, home phone number. So wow. he started calling the home over and over and over. And she went and ripped the phone out of the wall. And it was at that point that she was like, what is going on? Like, you need to tell me what's happening, what's going on, what's happening, what's going on. And I, my, her mom came out and said, hey, Drake, can I talk to you in the kitchen for a second? I was like, sure. So we go in the kitchen, she shuts the door and she goes, so what's going on? I'm like, what? She goes, This is not a normal. This is not normal. You're my daughter's young boyfriend. Like, this isn't normal. What, is there something, you know, you want to talk about? Is there something? And at that time I was so, so scared. And I was like, no, no, there's nothing. There's nothing going on. She's like, well, you know, my, my, uh, my girlfriend had, uh, her, her dad had, um, gotten brain cancer 
and tragically passed away not not too uh, many years prior to this. And so she was she had a therapist that she was going to. So she's like, we're going to take you to your ther- to to her therapist um, tomorrow, and just sit down with him. And if you feel like saying anything, then uh, you know. But we're going to go see the doctor tomorrow. So I sat down with him and was like, no, you know, it is getting, but, but I felt a twinge of, I felt a little bit like, oh, this could be my, my out. Like this could be the way that I get away from him. I can at least say things are getting weird. Things are getting strange. So I told him that I said, you know, everything was normal, but now it's getting a little, a little strange, but I didn't say anything had happened. And then, um, finally I had, had enough and I blew up on uh, my mom on the phone and told her everything that was happening. I, I don't remember if I was at my girlfriend. I think I was at my brother's. I, I can't remember, but, um, and then, and then I had told my girlfriend and we were at her house and I told my girlfriend and we were both just bawling and tears and, and, uh, <clears throat> we ended up just laying on the couch all night and holding each other and, and, uh, crying and, you know, and she was, I mean, to this day, she is, let's just say he wouldn't want to meet her in a dark alley. (laughs) You know, I mean, she's very, she was very protective of me and did not go over well with her. And so we, um, and then she would, she would sit in, uh, I might have told her before I told my mom. And because I remember, well, she reminded me of one time when we were at my house and we were on my bed and we were talking and she's like, you have to say something. You have, like, you can't, this person cannot be, <clears throat> excuse me, no. out there doing these types of, of things. In that moment, you were still doing Drake and Josh? We hadn't started this. We this hadn't, next we hadn't, season. We hadn't picked it. We were picked up, but we hadn't started filming yet. <clears throat> and she's like, you have to say something. He's going to end up working on the show. You have to, because uh, whether it was as the dad on the show, he would have been dialogue coach. And so she said, you have to say something. Something has to be done. We have to do something, you know, and you ha- and, 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 and I'm like, I can't, I don't want my name out there. I don't want this. I'm, I've got all this coming up. And she's like, no, you have to do it so you can be a John Doe. So your name won't be out there, you know. And so finally I, I, I blew up. I told my mom and next thing I knew there were detectives at the house. And what happened when you talked to your mom? She called, she got off the phone with me and called the police. Immediately. Immediately. And she got moved around and told where to, where to go. And I ended up uh, with the police. Did your father know at the same moment? No, I couldn't let my dad know. I, I was so. I, I couldn't let my dad know. My dad didn't know until later. Okay. Um, and so I, with the police came and I was being interviewed by the police and um, I had to tell them all the grisly details and of every time, everything that happened and how it happened and where it happened and when it happened and to these two strangers and my mom sitting at a dinner table. Um, and then fast forward, I you know I'm saying a lot, but fast forward, I, I ended up having to get on a phone that was connected to a tape recorder and get him to admit everything that he had done. Um, and when that happened, that's well, when it was like a normal call. Yeah. I had to pretend okay. that it was a normal call and ask him why he had done what he did. And that now I'm very confused and I'm dealing through with all of these emotions and this stuff. And I don't know how to work through it. And I don't know why, and why did he do this? And I don't understand my emotions and my thoughts and this and that. And he just opened up like a book. Kept asking, are you being, re- are we being recorded? Are we being recorded? And uh, no, no, no. I just, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot right now. And I, I just need to know, you know, what's this, what's that? Why did we do, why did you do this? Why did the, you do this? Why did, and And he opened up and we got a tape of him admitting what happened. And after that, uh, he was charged and arrested. And then the news got out everywhere. Well, not really, because that story was very suppressed. It's very interesting of why. 
And I later learned just recently <clears throat> of why that might have been the case because uh, there were f 41 or some odd letters written to the judge from people in Hollywood, directors, writers, actors, producers, um, in support wow. of him. No way. Saying he must have been pressured into it. That I could only imagine, one of the letters said, I could only imagine he was pressured beyond belief until he finally caved in. And all of the letters were saying that I was the one at fault, that I was the one that was coaxing him into doing what he did, that I was the one that he had to be under so much pressure and a victim of jail bait and that it was my fault and um, wow. I was asking for it and all of this, and which I didn't know these letters existed until this documentary. Um, but it, it really sheds a light on how the media suppressed his story. Yes. But there's so many interests. Because there's no, there were no, I mean, that's a huge story. Oof. You you have something like that happen at a children's network on such a grand scale. I mean, that's a headline for the New York Times. But it disappeared. Yes. It disappeared. What a shame. But I have this, you know, call it a conspiracy or call it whatever, but it's, it's in black and white. I'm looking yes, at yes. it there. It's, there's no conspiracy anymore. Yes. I mean, this is what it is. And every mistake and misstep that I made was amplified to such a degree. Miss, I mean, even with my things that I got into later in life, misinformation, misreporting, blatant lies that you just look on Google and you can find the real story, but nobody does that. We were talking about that earlier. They just take a, somebody tweeted something. Oh, that's a fact. Oh, somebody put a TikTok out. That's a fact. And so my name was being drugged through the mud my entire life after this. And it, and I think that that contributed to, you know, alcoholism, drugs, whatever I could do to escape relationships, you know, ended up hurting people along the way and burning bridges. And, and, uh, all of a sudden I would see my name in the papers and it would be saying this about me and that, Oh, another look at what happens to these young stars. They just, they always end up in the gutter and they always end up doing all these horrible things. And I'm just like every day having to read these things. So then that would contribute to me just wanting to escape. And then I would get another DUI or I'd be seen coming out of a, a bar or a club and be just out of my mind. And every single little mistake that I made was just blasted everywhere. But this guy ended up working again. No. On children's oh, television. No way. Yeah. On the Disney Channel. No. He ended up going and working on the Disney Channel. And what, I, uh, what I've learned... Today, ask him something about all these issues and all this problem? They didn't have to ask. They knew. They knew. And, and what those I learned still now, working there? What I learned now is some of the people who I ended up working with on Drake and Josh, thinking they were my friends, they know about it. Wrote letters. Were some against of, were you. Were some of the people who wrote letters. I support him. Supporting him and against me. And those are the same people who were working on the shows that he eventually got hired on again to work around kids and be around kids. It's and incredible. So my whole life I had, you know, been getting all of this stuff in the press and, and, and the world thinking I'm a monster and all of these horrible things happening. And he was hanging out on set, working, going to parties, being around Hollywood, like nothing happened. And um, I remember one time I saw him at a restaurant and he was at, the table with like 10 or 12 actors, all John, male actors John between Adam. the ages of 14 and 16. Whoa. And 
I walked in and saw him and saw that he was just right back to what he was doing and turned around and left. And he, he was sentenced to 16 months in prison. Just uh, 16 months? Just 16 months. And I think only of which he served maybe four. Um, and when he got out, he was a registered offender, a registered sex offender for crimes against a, a child. And he um, went right back to work on, on the Disney Channel, on Fox, on all of these companies just hired him again. Does he still working? Well, yeah. hopefully after this documentary, no. Do you? But, but if you check his IMDb, I mean, he worked, he, he's got a plethora of, I mean, oh. he recently worked on a movie where he played a, a teacher in a school with all young actors. Do you were afraid of him after all this? Terrified. I mean, there was, there was such a... Because watching because him I in a restaurant I, and face to face, I, I guess it could be, be really, really tough. Yeah, and I knew how connected he was. I didn't know until seeing these letters how connected and how people, I mean, they wrote love letters about him. He doesn't deserve jail. He doesn't, he was, he was in, it's not his fault and all of this. And from, I mean, huge producers, huge actors. And a tragic thing is when I went to court for the sentencing, I had my mom, my, my friend, my brother and my stepdad and myself. So it was five of us on my side of the courtroom. And how many of them? There wasn't an empty seat. Whoa. It was completely full of actors, people I grew up with watching, people who I considered my friends who knew me through him and in the business. Um, a lot of young, uh, young actors, a lot of minor actors, a lot of major uh, older actors. Uh, Um, and I walked into that producers, director, I mean, just a slew of famous people. Did you have an opportunity to, to tell them anything in front of them? Well, what I did is I, I had a moment to stand up and talk and I said, I'm not going to address Brian because there's no reason I need to. Um, but how dare you guys? Like, this is re-traumatizing. I go, you, you, you heard the judge, you've heard what he admitted to, you know, what's happening. You, uh, I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. I can't sleep at night. I'm losing my hair. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to be alone. I, 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 I'm, this is this, I have to live with this for the rest of my life, but you guys are going to have to live with the fact that you're on that side of the courtroom and, and, Shame on you. And that's all I have to say. And I never heard from any of them, some of which, some of them I worked with later on other projects. Mm -hmm. Sandy Bell told you sorry about it? Nope. Nope. Wow. The letters have been released. One, one person who wrote the letters made a public apology. Everyone else, no apologies. Some people have tried to get ahead of the story and say, oh, we were manipulated. We didn't understand what was going on at the time. He told us something different, but it was, it's very interesting that they didn't say that until they knew that the letters were about to be released. How do you deal with your mental health in that moment or in the course of that? With absolute self-destruction just any way that I could escape, any way that I could, you know, my, my relationship with my girlfriend just fizzled away because I felt gross. I felt I didn't, I felt, I, 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 and I felt shame and I felt angry and I, I, I was mad at the world and I took it out on everybody around me. Um, and I knew that I could uh, drink or put something in my body that at least would make me, you know, Forget. but that always, it just, that's even worse because then you're, you know, you're at home by yourself and you're, you're, Whoa. you're can't, you can't properly 
work through these things. Um, and so I ended up just going down, you know, and down and down. I was able to maintain sort of a professional, uh, you know, I ended up working on Drake and Josh and was able to maintain, you know, being professional and showing up on time and knowing my lines. But that was because I needed a job and I, it, that was the only thing that I loved doing. When, when you watch the last um, seasons of Drake and Josh, you saw you different? I mean, I know where I, depending on the scenes and where I'm at in wow. my life, I know exactly what's going on. What happened after all these drugs issues? Um, what happened in that moment? Um, Or in that? There was a long period of time that I struggled with all of this. Um, <clears throat> made a lot of poor choices. Um, made some mistakes and um, unfortunately- Which kind of mistakes? DUIs, um, I had an issue uh, not too long ago, oh, about two years ago, where I had been talking with somebody uh, on Instagram that I that later turned out to be underage. I didn't know that what I was getting myself into. And um, I was, there were charges brought against me uh, because they claimed This person had claimed that we had, I had done all of these horrible things uh, physically and, and was sending uh, inappropriate pictures. Photo pictures and all of these types of things. And so I was investigated for about 18 months. They took my phone and my computers and subpoenaed all of my social media and everything. And um, to which they found that none of that had occurred. Um, but because I had been talking in a, in a, in an, in, in a way that I shouldn't have been, uh, before the age had come to light, um, they were able to bring charges against me. And then, uh, this, they made a statement in court, um, and said that I'd done all of these things and the media picked that up and, and, and ran articles saying that this is what I pled guilty to and this is what I did and the entire world thought that I was some monster, which was really hard for me because I was being called <clears throat> by the entire internet and media uh, <clears throat> what Brian is, you know? And so I was going, wait a minute, no, this isn't me. This is like, no, this is my abuser. and. <laughs> In that moment, the world doesn't know about Brian. No. And all this stuff. No, the world had no idea. And so I was dr just, the media reported, I mean, the New York Times reported that I was a registered sex offender and, and that I had pled guilty to sexual assault and that, but none of which was true. Um, I pled guilty to these messages, conversations. these conversations Uh, and nothing physical and <clears throat> it was even brought up in, in, in the, the, the trial and that, you know, this is not what this case is about. It's not a sexual assault case. It's not a, any, it's not, he's not pleading guilty to anything physical or anything, ah, it's so dirty to say, but anything sexual and, um, but the media only took the first half of my trial and put that all over the news because that was more salacious and was going to get more attention. And I had media outlets like the New York Times saying, which they just yesterday okay. printed a retraction wow. to that article. But it's very important. But who reads the retractions? You know, I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, it's important for me and it's yes. important for the world to see that because if the New York Times reports it, well, it's got to be a fact. They, they, they do their research and it's got to be a fact. Um, and so that was another traumatic experience where I... Uh, uh, sorry, at the end you were completely innocent. No, the, the court well, said I, about I, that or I, not? About... 
what I was accused of, yes. But because I hadn't, because I had engaged in certain conversations, um, that was what they were able to charge me with. Okay. So I ended up getting charged and doing a, a year of community, uh, 200 hours of community service and two years of probation. Um, but what the internet was reporting and what the media was reporting was a far cry from the reality of my situation. And so it was just unbelievable. And unlike the case with Brian, that got no media coverage whatsoever, this was everywhere. And everyone was, he's a monster. He's a, 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 a word I don't even wanna say. Um, he's a, a predator. He's, and I was, and I mean, up until even now, um, was majorly canceled. And um, luckily, I had, in, in, in 2008, I came out and I played a concert out here in Auditorio Nacional. Mm -hmm. And the reception for my music was so incredible, like nowhere else I'd ever played in the world. And so I was like, what's going on in Mexico and Latin America with my music? They're embracing it so much. Like, I want to go play. I want to be there. I want to be where my fans love my music, not just the show, not just my acting, but music is my passion. And so I want to be there. And so I started to really cultivate that relationship and coming down here more and playing mm -hmm. here more. And luckily, um, even though it was a huge story here and I did get canceled and all of that. The media did much more uh, research on my case. They looked into it more uh, and were able to come to the conclusion and see the reality of what had happened. And so out here, I was able to kind of get my life back and get and get things going again because the media didn't treat me or, or not me, but well, yes, me, but treat my situation like the media in the, in the, in the States, in the U S and, um, I was able to get the truth of what had happened out here, um, a lot easier than what had happened in the States. So I started spending much more time out here. I was able to play, make music again, and I was able to do this. And then the media in the US used that against me and said, oh, Drake Bell escaped to Mexico because he's, he's escaping the, 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 the media, in, or he's escaping his problems and his legal issues in the US. And, and he, he went down to Mexico to escape. And then some very, if the media would say things about Mexico, like, like, oh, he's going to be safe down there because Mexico accepts people like that. I mean, saying things about Mexico Whoa. and about Latin America that were just, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, no, if you come here and that, if my situation was how the media was portraying it in the U.S., I would not be accepted in Mexico. They would be like, of no, course. sorry, like, no, like, this is not okay. Yes, it's the same. It's the same. But the way the media was portraying it was I was finding a safe haven out here because I was being, you know, just horrible things um, about here. And, and that, it was just, it, it just was piling on and piling on and piling on. And I finally had a breaking point and I started to spiral and my mental state was just completely unhealthy. And I had had seven years of sobriety. I didn't drink, I didn't do anything for seven oh. years. Well, six and a half, six and a half years. I like to round up to seven. But- Did you went a roop? Not oh. those seven years, which I think was the pro was just why it was so easy for me to fall okay. back. And I went seven years and I, I but when this started happening, I knew I, I knew I always had that bottle or that thing at the, that could get me out of my mind. And I started to spiral again. And <clears throat> it all came to a head when 
and this was big media coverage too, was I went missing uh, when I, I, I was in Florida and I just lost my, I just had lost. Your mind? My, I, I want to put it a different way, but in a sense, yeah. And I just wanted to disappear. And so I started telling my family these horrible things. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to, what am I doing? What, how am I going to continue? How am I going to go, how am I going to move forward? And, and did you really think about suicide in that moment? I mean, I'm sure there were moments that it crossed my mind and, but I really wanted to just disappear. I didn't know what that meant. I just didn't want to be around anymore. And so I, I had gotten in my, in, I had a, I rented a car out in Florida and I got in my car and I just drove and went to bars and tried to drown my sorrows and ended up Uh, not responding to my family mm -hmm. at one point. Do you have your phone with you in that yeah, moment? Yeah, I have my phone and then I left my phone in the car and I started to not respond and then hours went by and hours went by and my family, especially my brother, was going, wait a second, like after everything he just said, the way he sounded on the phone and now he's not responding, he's, I have to do something. And so they called the police and reported me missing and um, I was... I ended up getting to a hotel somehow and checking in. And the next day, I, the police found me because it was all over the news. And so I'm sure someone from the hotel was like, oh, well, he just checked in here last night. And I was picked up and taken to a facility, uh, like a mandatory three-day hold facility. And um, after that, I got back home and my family was just so worried about me and concerned and my brother had found a rehab facility for me and I think it was yeah it was alcohol and other things that I needed to go to rehab for but really it was my state of mind it was I was I didn't know how to handle everything that was going on because with trauma also When something traumatic happens and you've had trauma in your past, mm -hmm. all of your trauma comes back at once. Yes. And now you're dealing with everything. You're not just dealing with what's happening at that moment. You're dealing with everything. Yes. It's a large heard. train mm -hmm. going direct to you. Yep. In that moment. And you keep and so, thinking all the stuff. Exactly. Thinking of everything and you have to deal with it all at that time. And so I ended up um, getting... Uh, my, my brother found this facility for me and I went to, ended up going to Nashville, Tennessee and checking into rehab. And I was at the lowest um, I'd, I'd been since the Amanda show days in that situation. And I just was completely lost. But uh, luckily, uh, while I was there, I was able to clear my my system and my mind wasn't clouded and blocked and foggy and I was able to start dealing with all of these issues and emotions and traumatic events and experiences uh, in a healthier way around people who knew what they were doing when it came to things like this and I was there for quite some time and was able to come out and have more tools uh, to be able to face this head on and realize, you know, these things don't have to define you. You're not alone. Um, it's okay to talk about. There are people you can discuss these things with that won't judge you, that will, um, that are there to just, they just want to see you get better and to move forward and, and able to, give me the tools to where now where I'm at in my life is, you know, I look back and a lot of people ask me if there's, you know, things I regret in my past and things that I would change. And of course, the obvious answer the, that you would think would be, well, yeah, all the mistakes and everything that I did wrong and I would change all of that. But you look back at it now and I, I, I see that there's so much to learn Yeah. From all of that. 
And, and now, you know, we were discussing bef just before is moving forward now and, and, and knowing and having a much broader knowledge of how to navigate through this life. Um, because everyone handles trauma differently. So it doesn't matter whether, you know, I mean, I was in a really bad car accident when I was 19. Surely you almost died. I almost died. I broke my jaw in three places. I knocked, all these teeth are fake. I fractured my neck. I, my jaw was wired shut for six months. Whoa. And, you know, whether it's an event like that or uh, something like I went through uh, prior to that um, or things that occurred because of the trauma I was dealing with um, and, 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 and realizing too that, you know, taking responsibility for, I'm going to start crying again, taking responsibility for the things that you have done because, I mean, nobody forced this into my system. Nobody forced me to treat people the way that I, that I did. Uh, nobody forced me to react the way that I did. Um, you know, there was still responsibility and decisions that I made. Um, but understanding that that's not you, that doesn't have to be you moving forward and it doesn't have to define you or destroy you. Yes, of course. And for example, if you feel in a low point right now, today, tomorrow, uh, who you need to call, who you can call? Well, that's a, 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 a big part of it is keeping people around you that build you up when you're, you're doing well and you're, 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 you know, you're in a great state of mind and, or a healthy state of mind. Um, keeping people around you that'll build you up in those moments, but also keeping people around you that you trust and that feel comfortable enough with you to be honest and say, bro, like, you know, you're, you're going down that path again. Like, like, hang on, back up, think about this, take a breath. Let's get through this. Like I, you know, I love you and I, but I'm not just going to sit here and praise you mm -hmm. and say everything you're doing is great because right now you need to step back and realize that, you know, is something going on inside? Is there something happening that's making you sort of veer this way? Let's get you back on track, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to have a solid support system. And I think that with um, my brother and, you know, my, my, my brothers and, Um, my sister and my my dad and my mom and I have uh, very close friends out here, especially in Mexico. Um, I have a great group of uh, I have, uh, my I've I always keep now I because back in those days there were a lot of people just hanging on and wanting a yes. piece of this and wanting a piece of that and wanting to because you got to get to go to the cool parties and you got to be around the famous people and you got to go you know and oh, Drake's taking us out to the best dinners and we're getting to go on vacations and we're getting to do cool stuff. And you realize that those people are temporary. Yes. And having people around you that know you completely mm -hmm. and know your, your darkness, know your light and see you for who you really are and love you for that Um, is really, really important to, to keep those people very, very close to you. Okay. Um, and, and that don't have a, a fear of talking about things or bringing something up to you when it needs to be said. Do you have a therapist or a professional near? Because about rocks issues, it's very difficult to be alone. Yeah, I went, I, I, I have, I have a therapist back in Los Angeles and I, I, I have one here and it's, uh, it's very hard to be alone, but we were, we were discussing that earlier yes. off camera. And I think that's something that people need to hear is when I was younger, it was very, very hard for me, especially after what had happened to me, for me to be alone 
by myself with my own thoughts mm -hmm. and to feel comfortable and safe just being alone. I always had to have people around. And with that, you start attracting or keeping people around you that shouldn't be around you just because you need yes. to be around people. And because you can't be alone. Yeah, because you can't be alone. But I think what we were saying earlier is it's very, very important to work on being able to be alone and feeling okay about that. Be a father of a three-year-old child helps. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely, that's definitely um, been a big part of my life is having, uh, and, and I think that's a big part of what, you know, has kept me going because we see so many people in this industry that have had similar situations that don't make it. You know, they either sadly pass away or end up never, never coming back from these, the darkness. They never step out of the darkness. And I think a lot of it happened in rehab where I was sitting there going, you know, what is my story that I'm going to be able to tell my son one, oh. hmm. you know, what's the story that I'm going to be able to, thanks. You know, what's the story that I'm going to be able to tell my son one day? Is it going to be somebody else telling him about his dad? You know, about, yeah, you know, your dad got chewed up and spit out by the world. And then he made these horrible, you know, these, these bad decisions and, and he didn't make it. And what would that mean for him moving forward if anything happened to him? Or am I going to be able to, oh man, or am I going to be able to tell him when he's in moments in his life that he's struggling with that I understand and that I've been through, this is what I've been through and there's a way to, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And you have two options, Drake. You can fall down, use a boxing metaphor, so I can get out of the, this very emotional state that I'm in right now. Um, you can stay down on the mat and you can your son can say, you know, yeah, my dad fought the big fight, but he got knocked out. Or I could say that, you know, the mat is no place for a champion and a winner. So no matter what this world throws at you, however hard the punches are, you know, if you can find the strength to get back up and walk towards your opponent, you know, they can beat you to a bloody pulp. But as long as you go the distance, you stay up, then there's, you can find, you can find victory. And when I was in rehab, I kept telling myself that I said, you can either show your son that you can find victory or you can show him that it, this world can destroy you. So that gave me the strength to kind of say, no, 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 my story, that's not my story. My story isn't on the mat with the bell ringing. That's not, sorry, like I'm gonna get up and you're going to have to, I mean, do a lot more damage than that 
to keep me from moving forward. And, and, and that moving forward is finding the tools to change and finding ways to become a better person and to react to things differently and to change behaviors and to learn from, from everything you've been through in life. And through that, um, you have the ability to, to move forward and, and be a better person and have a, a, a fruitful and, and, um, You know, I mean, I want to say a happy life, but we are in the real world and things are always going to happen and you're going to, but having those tools that when those things happen now, being able to navigate a healthy path yes. and a successful path through, through that, through those things. I guess right now, um, you have different and special tools uh, I'm talking about your child. Uh, I, I'm a father of three, two. So I guess sometimes the laugh of your child, yeah. uh, the way that he touch you yeah. or need you or hug you, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a big, big, big power yeah. to go through a lot of things, yeah. um, deal with a lot of stuff yeah. that's very hard because life is hard and it's hard for everybody. But... There are some persons that have special situations, uh, like in our case, both of us have a divorced parents. Yeah. And of course, these moments start to giving you some paths or some situations that's gonna, gonna hurt. Yeah, yeah. After. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, there's something that my, my ex-wife would say, well, says to me sometimes when I'm, when she knows I'm going through really difficult situations, she just reminds me like, your son had, your son adores you. Your son loves you more than anything. So what else matters? You know, and when I get told that by her, everything really does just kind of disappear, you know, it kind of becomes what's really important. Why am I, why am I letting these outside elements destroy me when my, my focus should be on him having that view of me for the rest of his life. And of course, as he grows, you're going to find things online about me and everything. So it's important that at that moment, whether he's 10, 12, 14, whatever, is able to look at dad and go, yeah, my dad went through a lot. And my dad made a lot of bad choices. A lot of things happened to him. He's been through a lot. But my dad today is my hero and my best friend. I, I, I'm sure it's going to be in that way because uh, you were telling me about uh, what do I'm going to say to him. Uh, and I guess exactly the same that we talked today. Yeah. The truth. Yeah. When you say the truth, people know, um, know, know what happened, know that somebody is accepting uh, things. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of good decisions and everybody have a bad decisions. Yeah. So it's life. Uh, yeah. And I guess it's a good way to teach. Uh, yeah, and I think that, the, like, like you said, it's, it's showing like, You know, even though dad, you know, dad's been through these things, he didn't run from them and he, you know, 
there's a responsibility you have to take. And I hope that that's something that he can take away and, you know, hopefully learn from. And, and I think that's something becoming a father, you, you want to give your, your, your kids everything that you never had and, and, you know, not have the upbringing that you had, you want to change, you want to give them everything, but also, um, you want them to, uh, understand that there's, you know, a responsibility that you need to take when, when things happen or you do things that you shouldn't have done. Um, and, and face those things and not, uh, you know, yeah. Mm. I had a much more eloquent, eloquent way of saying that in my brain, but it <laughs> didn't come out. <laughs> I, I really want to say you thank you about yeah. all this interview. And, yeah. uh, and I really think that when people, when we accept our mistakes, we are really, we really can be able to improve. It's the only way to grow. Yes. It's, it's the, the, only, way it's the only way to grow. And, um, and that's, to, to bring it full circle, yes. I, I, I think that this time where I am right now um, is, is allowing me to really work through so much um, that I haven't been able to because it's all been locked inside. And that's with this, with this documentary and with the, with the new single with the new song. that I really get impressed about the video because yeah. in the video you I talk about talk my about abuse I talk about the car ac I mean uh, the car accident the my rehab my my son uh, like it, it's 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 sort of a a mini movie of all of these events uh, the, the name is kind of relate I kind of relate yeah. I kind of relate yeah and I think that when I sat down and started writing for this album, I wasn't thinking I was going to make an album because it was at a point where I was thinking, no, we would ever want to hear my music again anyway. Um, and it was just sort of my diary. That's how I write. You know, I, I don't really sit down and write in a journal. I write songs. And that's how I get stuff off of my chest. And I started writing this song and the, the whole record really deals with, it's a very autobiographical, what's been going on and my, my life in the past few years. And, um, I, and, and a lot of times lyrics come just subconsciously. I don't really think about what am I going to write about right now? I just kind of sit down and start just throwing, just stuff starts coming out. And I know 10% of it I'll probably keep and 90% will just be just me getting my emotions out. And I think with, uh, I just started sitting down. I was like, I kind of relay. Uh, um, I found beauty in my pain. I'm running away from all the uh, sh uh, abuse and all the shame. And it's just, it's, all this stuff just started coming out mm -hmm. and um, the wrong decisions I have made and all this stuff started coming out. And I didn't, sometimes you don't know what a song really means until after you've written it and recorded it and listened to it. Okay. Even if you wrote it, you start to go, oh, that's what I, that's what I meant by that. And I kind of relate, brings me back to what I probably have needed, had needed to hear for so many years is you're not alone. Like I can relate to your pain. I can relate to your trauma. I can like, you can talk about it and you can work through it with other people, not just by yourself alone, because there are other people who can relate to what you've been through and what you're going through. And yeah. so that's sort of the, the idea of the song is telling people who might be in similar situations or going through tough times is, you know, I can, I kind of relate. Yes. Like I can relate to what you're going through. And you're not alone. Yes. I, I want to give you a gift. And I guess it's exactly about this. Um, because you're not alone. Um, I want to give you this that shows you, I guess, exactly who you are with. 
this is you wow. in two moments in your life. This is about 40 and 50 years where all this difficult stuff happened. Uh, this is you right now. Um, I'm sure that you are not longer alone because you are with the Odell Drake. And I'm sure that you can speak now every time you need it to your inner child and say, Drake, Drake of 14, 15, Drake teen, I know that you felt alone, mm -hmm. but in this moment you are not because here's a 37 adult years old that embrace everything, that face all the mistakes and want to improve like people and you are not alone. Maybe in that moment, I don't know, and, and I'm not judging any parent, no? Uh, but in that moment, maybe you felt alone yeah. or you stay really alone. Yeah. You don't need, um, yeah, you, you, you need a mother-in-law, you don't need girlfriend, you don't need anybody, you need a uh, host. You just need you, and you stay here right now mm -hmm. for him. So I want to give you this, and I hope it could help if you have another moment, because everybody going to have a lot of moments in the rest of our life that we hope be a large life for everybody. And try to think that we are not alone, no longer, yeah. no, not anymore. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank you, Drake, to be here. And there's two, two different Drakes there. What a trip. What a journey. What a journey. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for everything. Thank you for, for being brave, not in this interview, mm -hmm. for being brave in your life. I. I know you or I met you two or three years ago, right now in the last project that we um, work in the same program, La Mascara, but this is the first time that I really know you. Yeah. Uh, and I really, I am really happy to know you. And if you need some help in any moment, count with another extra friend in Mexico And um, thank you, thank you for everything. And I really appreciate your time, your braveness, and yourself. Oh, thank you so much. This was, uh, this was like a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for taking the time. For free. And, yeah, for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know for free. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have cameras. They don't, they don't have cameras in the therapy session. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> yeah, but no, it's, um, but no, this is a very cathartic experience. So thank you for taking the time and having me on and it was wonderful. And um, one last gift. I know you are on TV. Mm -hmm. I'm too. <laughs> I know that you are a host too. I'm too. I of course know that you are a handsome guy. I'm you too. are too. <laughs> so I want to give you a new project idea. Drake and George. <laughs> Drake and George. I think it's a good time. It's going to be a hit. I, guess. I can tell you, this is a hit right here. I, I guess we can do it. No? 100%. Abrázame, hermano. Abrázame, hermano. <laughs> thank you. Thank 100, you. 100, yeah. Put that right there. <laughs> thank yeah, you for thank everything. You, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Bueno, chicos, ah, ha sido una plática increíble. Espero que les haya gustado tanto a mí, tanto como nosotros como equipo la disfrutamos. Les mando un gran abrazo. Gracias, gracias por estar tan pendientes. Gracias por vernos tanto. Gracias por vernos en todo el mundo de esta manera. Estamos verdaderamente sorprendidos y muy, muy agradecidos porque... Sin ustedes no hay un nosotros. Así es que muchas gracias. Gracias, Rick. Gracias a todo el equipo. Gracias, chicos, siempre a todo el equipo de entrevista. A mi querido Tuco, a Cristian Manolo, a Oana, a mi querido Alex, a, este, a mi querido Jerry, a, este, a todos, a todas, a todos. Muchas gracias por, por estar aquí. Gracias a todos. Así es que, bueno, pues esto se hace entre muchas gentes. Así es que muchas, muchas personas. Estoy emocionado. Bye. Gracias.